I feel very at home in Jerusalem, so I, I wasn't very concerned. But some of my crew suddenly said, oh, you know, we're ending up in jail today because, you know, the tomb is on private property. And uh, <laughs> we busted, you know, we bust the cement slab, you know. We kind of got permission after the fact. Everybody was screaming. They called the police. By the end, we were all having tea and cookies together, and we, you know, we, we paid money for a swing set in the, in the garden. But there were some harrowing moments in the making of this film. One of them is that when I went into the tomb, some people decided, hey, you can't go there. I think they were wrong, but I think we didn't break any law. But we had to make peace with the tenants and peace with the, co with the police. We had to make peace with the, the archaeologists. And for one time, I wouldn't let it go. When we found the wrong tomb, we found two tombs. I mean, we actually on camera found two tombs. Mind-boggling for me that I look at it and I say, is that us? But when we found the first tomb, it was like, wow, pristine footage from a 2,000-year-old tomb, a tomb from Jesus' time, untouched. Wow, excitement. Wrong tomb. This is not the tomb we're looking for. So it was like this happiness and, and, and sadness at the same time. So everybody said, let's kind of pack it in and, and go. But I was so obsessed that we went with the sonar thing, trying to find, you know, 20 meters. And I ended up, I guess, because I, I, I wasn't paying attention what time it was, how close I was getting to the building. I wanted to find this tomb. And I guess I get, got too close to somebody's window or bedroom window, I don't know. But some, suddenly I see this guy with a steak knife running around claiming that I'm a peeping Tom and look, looking at his wife. And, you know, it took a little, hey, buddy, you know, the only, you know, the only bones I'm interested in are buried in the ground, you know, for 2,000 years. So it was like a little bit of, uh, <laughs> it was, you know, then it was so crazy, the story I told him, that he believed me. You know, like nobody makes up, I'm in your garden because I'm looking for a 2,000-year tomb with sonar equipment. So, you know, either I was very inventive or I really was. But after he said, you know, get out of my garden. After that, I decided to go back to the hotel and we continued the investigation during daytime, you know, when everybody was at work, and that's what we did. I mean, for me, I, I mean, every step, you know, finding two tombs on camera, climbing into what, the, what is arguably the, the Jesus family tomb, just being there, crawling in, you know, feeling the, feeling the space. You know, the fir we opened up a shaft and wind went in there. And then suddenly I looked and there were letters, Hebrew letters floating in the air. I, th I thought I'm hallucinating. As it turns out, after the tomb was found and abandoned in 1980, uh, a local rabbinical school buried holy books there because under Jewish law, holy books, when they disintegrate or they're torn, you can't throw them out. You can't just put them in the garbage. You have to bury them uh, like a human being. So the, it's called a geniza. And this tomb was turned into a geniza before it was sealed. Nobody knew that until we climbed in. You know, I guess the rabbinical school knew, but no archaeologists knew. No archaeologists, even the one, even the one or two that knew that the tomb existed, didn't know that it had been turned into a geniza. I didn't know. So when I went in there, there was a shaft of air, and it swirled. You know, this disintegrating holy book. So Hebrew letters started floating in the air. I looked and I thought, okay. You know, I'm now fantasizing. And then I looked around, I realized, I'm in the Geniza. You know, there's books all over the place here. And that was like one of these multidimensional moments when, you know, kind of the mystical realm and the physical realm meet. What, what does this all mean, you know? And um, I guess it meant that we should continue our investigation, and we did. One interviewer said, I got a, got a little bit, I don't know what to call it, said, you know, people will ask, you know, how come a filmmaker discovered this tomb, this filmmaker and, and his academics? And I said, L let me correct that. First of all, I didn't discover the tomb. It's not my discovery. I, in a sense, identified it. Maybe I threw some light on it, journalistic light, but I didn't discover it. Archaeologists discovered it. The bulldozer discovered it. Archaeologists excavated it. You know, I did not discover it. Secondly, the film and the, and the books academics are not my academics. Some of these people I, I, I never met before or after I interviewed them. 
I went to the top people. I went to the epigraphy, you know, who can read what it says on the, I went to, you know, Frank Moore Cross, the le legendary ep epigrapher from Harvard. He could have said, no, it doesn't say Jesus, it says something else, you know. I'm not an epigrapher. I'm not, I'm not a DNA expert. I went to the top people. So, so it's not my tomb, right? And I'm not, what I, I have a skill set. I'm not an archaeologist, but I have a skill set. Investigative filmmaking, that's my skill set. And I did what any honest journalist will do. Follow the leads, go to the experts, report the story. Now, now it's your story. What are you going to do with it? 